It's a question that many of us have wondered, but probably very few of you have asked, how much does a pro triathlete earn? Now, of course, the answer to this varies considerably from athlete to athlete, and understandably, very few athletes are willing to share this information. Except one. Yeah, we are very fortunate today to have multiple Ironman champion Cody Bills join us to explain a little bit about this alongside our own experiences to give you a better insight into how and how much a pro triathlete earns. Now, of course, athletes like Alistair Brownlee, Daniela Reef, and Jan Fredane are quite clearly in the exceptional minority, both in terms of their performance and overall earnings. And whilst they will earn a lot through prize money, it's very likely, and I'm quite sure of this, earning far more through lucrative sponsorship deals. Now, before we delve into the earnings of a pro triathlete, it's worth pointing out that a short course ITU athlete earns their money typically in a very different way to how a long course athlete will earn their money. So for a short course ITU athlete, an aspiring Olympian, their earnings here in the UK are typically split between national lottery funding that comes in through the national governing body, prize money from ITU races, the WTS series and whatnot, and potentially some individual sponsorship deals. But of course this differs from nation to nation and the relevant national governing bodies. But this format that I've just mentioned here in the UK is the same system that Fraser and myself have been through and also Heather with Modern Pentathlon. But of course with this format, each athlete each year has to hit a certain criteria in which they're then judged and sort of put on a different level of funding. You can receive anything from a livable allowance through to travel expenses, race expenses, all the way through to a livable salary, all geared towards helping you towards the Olympic Games. Now this funding allocation runs across four years for the Olympic cycles and can increase or decrease depending on athletes' performances. So you really start to understand how much pressure is on the shoulders of those athletes that are competing at the Olympic Games. And then moving on to the prize money for these ITU athletes, and they're typically picking their money up from the WTS series races, World Cups, European Cups, Pan American Cups, and so on and so forth. And it kind of goes down in that order from the WTS series races. So for the WTS series, they have a prize pool of $2.4 million. That's split across seven races with a bonus pool of $855,000, which is split amongst the top 35 ranked athletes at the end of the year. Now each WTS race has a prize pool of $150,000 with $18,000 for first place and $1,000 for 20th. And this increases for the grand final at the end of the season. Finish as world champion in the WTS series and you'll pick up a bonus of $83,500. Finish ranked 20th in the series and it's a more modest $4,900. So as you can see, there is the potential to earn some very good money there, but it does drop off very quickly. If you were to come in in 10th place, you're earning as little as around $1,900. And with start lists as much as 50 athletes and more, that means that many athletes are actually finishing outside of this prize money altogether. But of course, if you're going to these races and it's funded for or travel expenses, accommodation are paid for by your national governing body, then you could be coming home with a pretty good payday. But if they're not, then you could be coming home with far less or potentially even in debt. And of course, the WTS series is the top level of racing with the highest prize purse and bonus pools and all sorts. If you're only racing World Cups, which many athletes are and they haven't quite made up to the WTS series or even just European Cups, the prize money is far less. And there's also the fact that national governing bodies rarely are paying for athletes and their travel expenses to go to those kind of races. And now moving on to sponsorship, and this is a really interesting one for the short course ITU athletes because if they're part of a team then yes those national governing bodies or teams may have sponsors but that doesn't mean the individual athletes are necessarily getting a paycheck as a result of that so they will be going out and trying to find their own individual sponsors but I've got to be honest it is incredibly difficult for the ITU athletes because let's face it you guys watching this now how many of you do draft legal racing yeah there's very few races out there it's almost limited purely to the elite ITU guys. And that means there isn't necessarily as much interest in it outside of the Olympic Games and therefore sponsors aren't always investing in it as much. So if you're not at the top of the game in this ITU racing, you're not a Flora Duffy or an Alistair Brownlee, then if you're in the middle of the pack, it can be really, really difficult for them to gain this individual sponsorship or anything that's lucrative enough.
Now for the long course athletes, the professional world can really look quite different. They're outside of any comfort blanket provided by national federations. And want for a better word, they have to fend for themselves. So they are predominantly trying to earn their money and their living through prize money and through sponsorship deals. And more recently, we've obviously had the introduction of the Professional Triathletes Organization, which has also introduced other streams of income for them. And from my own personal experience racing long course, I did find it easier to find individual sponsors. But when it came to racing, I continually found myself evaluating a race's potential earnings. I'd be looking at the depth of a field and my potential to do well in it, the prize money, the cost of expenses, accommodation, travel, and so on and so forth. Now, don't get me wrong, it's an incredible experience and a very privileged lifestyle, but one bad race outside of the prize money and you certainly started to feel the financial pressures of that as you're still having to pay your bills back home. But I've got to be honest, I never got to the point of being able to fully fund myself from my triathlon earnings. I was always doing a little bit of work on the side and for me that was predominantly coaching. So I thought it'd be valuable to talk to someone that was able to take it to that next step or to be honest, several steps. And that is Canadian long course athlete and multiple Ironman winner, Cody Beals. Hi Cody, great to have you here today. Um, now look, you've always been incredibly open about your earnings as a professional triathlete and the realities of what it takes to make a profit in the sport and sometimes even just make ends meet. Why do you do this? I mean, there's so many athletes out there that obviously are very closed on this subject. So I, I see pro triathlon being more competitive than ever. And the question is, like, how do I set myself apart a little bit in a sea of athletes, like at least two dozen men who have pretty similar results to me? And uh, openness has always come pretty naturally to me. And early on, I realized like there's a real appetite for transparency. So that's sort of one reason. Um, apart from that, coming into this career seven years ago, I remembered like there was no blueprint or roadmap for how to do this. So by helping put all this stuff out there, uh, hopefully I'm helping lead the way for some other pros a little bit. And um, lastly, I think really just the industry benefits from some transparency. There's a lot of murkiness and ambiguity around what exactly pros are worth. So by putting this information out there, perhaps I'm setting a bar, not necessarily a high bar or a low bar, but a reference point that others can look at to sort of gauge their worth, or at the very least kind of prompt some conversations around what is the value of a pro triathlete. Awesome. Now for people out there that perhaps aren't familiar with who you are, um, you ranked 19th in the PTO World Rankings um, last year. You've You've won numerous Ironman titles and 70.3 titles um, on top of a whole raft of other races. Can you tell us uh, briefly kind of your background in triathlon and this stepping up to becoming a pro athlete? So I started dabbling in triathlon kind of around my teen years. Um, it really wasn't something I took seriously at all. I had no inclination of going pro. And um, after working through university and a degree I didn't love, I sort of gave myself some time to pursue triathlon to see where it would take me. And to my complete and utter shock, I started to have some results that could indicate maybe I could hack it as a professional. And I kind of bided my time before taking my elite card but eventually with some pressing from other people made the jump and it's hard to believe that was seven years ago, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And come on, like, what are the realities of making a living from triathlon? You know, I think it's a lot less glamorous than people perceive. I think the perception is that we're jet setting around the world with super fit people. The reality is that I see a lot of nice hotel rooms or not so nice hotel rooms and I spend a lot of time managing fatigue. Um, I think also there's an expectation that we just train and race and sponsors pay us to be cool like that. Really, I didn't appreciate this, but there's a whole business side to the sport. And so I'm, I'm hustling hard to broker deals to maintain this network of sponsors, to drive value off the race course. I think we've also seen with the rise of social media, athletes aren't expected just to be athletes now, but also to be influencers or whatever you want to call it. I don't particularly love that term, um, but there's more to it than just racing these days. That's awesome, yeah. And have there been times that you've been tempted because of financial difficulty just to pack it in? Surprisingly, I've never really been tempted to pack it in because of that. And maybe it's just the level of financial planning I've put into it. I've definitely had hard periods in the sport where I haven't earned a whole lot of money. Um, I think it's pretty much a prerequisite to, to earn a living at the sport to you know, save some money for the harder times because it's not reliable. You'll just be consistently churning out good results and new sponsor deals. So through careful planning, keeping the focus on minimalism and simple living and not allowing my lifestyle to creep up, I've been able to kind of insulate myself against those inevitable ups and downs and earnings, basically. Um, now, was there a point in your career that you suddenly realized, I can do this, 
I'm earning enough money from prize money and sponsors, and this was sustainable. I would say there were kind of two decisive points. The first was a realization that I can earn any money at all from this sport. And that was pretty much my, my last race as an amateur. I would have finished among the pros and earned a paycheck had I been racing professional. So that was kind of a wake up call. That stung to miss out on that. Um, and I sort of hit the ground running in my first pro season with earning money because I really, I bided my time to take my elite card. I could have qualified a few years earlier, but I was hesitant to, and perhaps I waited too long. But in my first season, I was actually able to earn some money right away. It was a lot longer though, like several years later before I actually was able to sustain sort of a decent level of, of living off pro triathlon alone. And now we're going to delve in a little bit here. Now you've been so open on your blog and anyone out there that hasn't been on over to Cody's um, website and checked out his blog, please do because each year you put out very openly almost your, your tax return and, and your earnings over the year. So what sort of support do your sponsors give you? Do race organizers provide you with support? Um, what does this all look like? How How is the money coming in? So the support I get from sponsors can take a lot of different forms. And this is something I also didn't appreciate coming into the career. Uh, the best and what I'm always targeting is base salaries. It's hard to convince companies to part with money like that though. So more often you're looking at performance bonuses, which is sort of a lower risk outlay for the company. Uh, things like travel allowances, which can be really helpful. Um, even equity in some cases that's been on the table with smaller companies or startups who are cash poor. Uh, product, of course, that's what everyone's willing to offer, but perhaps the least helpful sometimes. And then everyone's favorite exposure. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have to choose races depending on where you can make a profit? Which ones, you know, you're almost cherry picking going, right, I think these athletes will be here, the depth of the field and so on and so forth. I mean, how does that affect you when it comes to choosing races? Oh, like picking races is something I just agonize over. Maybe it's my physics background, but I kind of look at it as like this multivariable optimization problem. And there's at least two dozen things I'm considering. It's like earnings prospects. How much money do I think I can make there? Timing in the season, does it fit? Um, development experience. Is this a championship race that's going to elevate my game to a new level? Travel expenses. What's it going to cost to get me there? Um, my strengths and weaknesses in relation to the course. I typically like the hot, flat, and windy course, um, so that's something to consider. Also, familiarity, like have I been there before? Do I have good vibes there? Um, are sponsors pressing me to go there? Usually I try and keep sponsors sort of hands off with my race selection, but sometimes that's a factor. And you know, sometimes it just comes down to a gut feeling, which increasingly I don't discount. So basically looking at my season, I try and pick a mix of races, some that are gonna be higher risk, higher reward, maybe a big payoff or nothing and others that are going to be like a more dependable source of income where I can hopefully just bang out a podium with some predictability. Brilliant and would you what would you say to anyone who's aspiring to be a pro and wanting to take that next step up is there any advice you'd share? So I mean I'll give you a specific piece of advice and a more general one I think approaching the course approaching the career from a financial perspective you want to try and minimize financial pressure some athletes do well under that kind of circumstance but personally I would really hate to have a lot of financial pressure so I think you want to put yourself in a, in, a, in a situation where it's not do or die with a triathlon career. So maybe you have some other income coming in from part-time work or coaching or something flexible, ideally, but it's not like you have to immediately start crushing it in triathlon to make ends meet. And I think just more generally, like be patient and, and learn to delay gratification. This is a sport where it can take over a decade to achieve your aerobic potential. And so it really rewards athletes who know how to play the long game. Well, thank you so much to Cody for that. It's been absolutely brilliant. If you haven't already had on over to his blog, I really do recommend you do that because he's literally just released his annual pro triathlon budget. Obviously, pandemic version, which makes it even more interesting, but he is incredibly thorough, in-depth, and very, very open. It was a great source of inspiration for me when I was racing. Now, Cody has touched on a lot there, but there is a couple more avenues that we're yet to explore and one of those is teams and a couple spring to mind of current times and that is the Erdinger team and the BMC VFIT team. Now the benefit of these is that they are providing a salary so you may be getting a paycheck in monthly which provides a lot of security which is one issue for athletes as we just discussed with Cody before. A downside to some of these teams is that they come with sponsors signed to the teams and that means that you are provided with kit which sounds fantastic but perhaps not always the product or the kit that you want to be using or you're comfortable with or works for you and that also then does limit you and potential earnings with sponsors outside of that. 
And then finally, there's the appearance fee. Now, Cody touched on this, but events will occasionally pay athletes a fee to have them at their event and racing. Now, events see this as an investment. Just having the athlete there brings credibility to the event, but also hopefully a high and exciting level of racing. Now, of course, there is a huge array of earnings of professional triathletes, but hopefully today's video has showcased the numerous different avenues for those earnings. And I'm sure I have missed some, so please do get involved in the comment section down below. Let me know if I've forgotten any, or if you are an aspiring pro and whether this video has been helpful for you. If so, I would fully recommend heading on over to Cody's blog, as I've just mentioned. If you've enjoyed today's video, please do hit that thumbs up button, give it a like. Don't forget to give us a follow over on social media. And if you're not doing so already, give us a subscribe just down below.